Uh, hi guys, my name is Alan Ennis. Uh, I'm a member of the North American Advisory Board of the UCD College of Business uh, and former president and CEO of Revlon. Uh, in these unprecedented and challenging times, uh, we are all aware that it has proven difficult for members of our UCD alumni community to get together in ways that we normally would. Um, for example, our BCOM reunion dinners or alumni award events, benefit dinners, Christmas reception, networking events, and so forth. Uh, COVID-19 has put all of that um, in a much more difficult situation. So therefore, the UCD College of Business has kicked off an alumni challenge, a virtual health and well-being event for members of our global business community. And it's entitled Around the Globe in 30 Days. And individually, whether indoors or outdoors, being cognizant of local COVID guidelines, of course, we are walking, running, cycling, uh, a target distance that contributes to the overall goal of collectively transversing the globe during a 30 day challenge. And this is about 45,000 kilometers that we're all going to try and um, uh, to achieve together. And as part of this initiative, I'm here today to discuss the topic of leadership and inspiration with two of Ireland's well-known and inspiring leaders. Uh, so with me, first of all, is Noreen O'Sullivan. Uh, Noreen was the Assistant Secretary, or is the Assistant Secretary General for Safety and Security at the United Nations, uh, and was the former Chief Commissioner of Angarda Siakona, uh, and she actually sits on the board of uh, the North American Advisory Board of UCD with me. And also joining me uh, this morning uh, is Connor O'Shea, um, Director of Performance Rugby uh, at England Rugby, the former head coach of the Italian national rugby team, former Ireland rugby player. He was played fullback, uh, got 35 caps for Ireland, and actually was a classmate of mine um, okay. in the UCD BCOM class of 1991, which kind of feels like a lifetime ago as I think back to 1991, my Lord, we're aging ourselves. And so this morning we're going to have a, a, a question and answer uh, informal format with, with Noreen and Connor. And so uh, with that uh, preamble, I'm going to start, Noreen, with you, if, if I may, um, to talk about the, the topic of overcoming obstacles. And, you know, given this global pandemic uh, that we're in with COVID, um, it's important to remember uh, that the lessons learned from obstacles we encounter can be fundamental to later success. And so, Noreen, as you look back on, on your, uh, your life to date, can you recount a time when you faced a challenge or a setback or a failure and how you overcome it, uh, overcame it um, and what you learned from it. Okay, thanks, Alan. And I think you're right. Uh, you, COVID, the pandemic has really torn up the rule book and thrown a lot of things, created havoc and is continuing to wreak havoc. And when I look back at my career, in at the start of my career in the very early 80s, so I'll age myself as well, I worked on the first undercover unit working in the inner city. So uh, looking at tackling the heroin problem and one of the greatest inspirations and lessons I heard was the way that the local community and families overcame adversity and how they dealt with challenges and adversity in their life. And it's something that stayed with me throughout my career. And during that time, I, one of my poets, uh, Rudyard Kipling, one of my favorite poets, there's a great line in his poem, If, and it says, if you can meet uh, victory and uh, vic triumph and defeat and treat those two imposters just the same. And that's something that always struck me because actually to be successful, you really do have to encounter disappointments and obstacles and setbacks. And we all encounter them in our everyday lives. And for me, one of the lessons is actually not allowing, uh, you have to own it. When it happens, you must own it. And I know throughout my career, I've had several disappointments. I've had setbacks. I've had things that were feisted upon me, not of my own doing, but actually you have to own them, you have to deal with them. But in owning them, it's good that you actually deal with all of the emotions it brings up, the anger, the hurt, the everything, but actually you can't allow it to define you. So in my experience, what you have to do is actually, yes, own it. You have to be able then to uh, overcome it. So that sounds very, very simple. It isn't always that simple. But what I found useful in my life and in my career was to have a, a very small but very uh, significant people that actually you can play back how you feel about it, that you can actually make sure that you deal with it as it happens, uh, but also that you have strategies to get out of it. And also remembering, and I think this is important for all of us in our life and particularly what we're dealing with at the moment, nothing lasts forever. And things do get better, but you do have to work your way through it. So that would be one of my takeaways from my career. I also think that uh, setbacks and challenges are actually 
opportunities for progress and learning in disguise. And that's, I'm a, a bit of a, a realistic optimist. So that's how I like to uh, define setbacks and challenges. They are opportunities for learning and growth in disguise. And that was the approach that I would take and encourage people to take. Very good. Well, of course, it's, it's uh, that's great advice, Lauren. I think I think what's challenging for lots of people is is being able to have that mindset in the moment. Uh, you know, when you're facing conflict, um, you know, when you look back on on, on a period of conflict or, or challenge, uh, it's a lot different than when you're actually living it. You know, and and people today who who are, you know, going through difficult times, whether they've lost a job or they've had a loved one who's who's uh, been, you know been inflicted with the, with COVID. It's uh, it's important to, to take that advice, which is to 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 face it uh, uh, head on. To, to your point, um, embrace it almost uh, in, in one level uh, and use it as a learning experience. And it's interesting as we you know, and Connor, switching to you as as we go through life, we you know we come upon individuals who deal with things exceptionally well. And as you look at at, at your at your rugby past and, and your 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 career, Connor, and you look you know you look at. Uh, leaders, you know, who inspire you, and, and throughout life we happen upon these individuals who inspire us. Either people with whom we have a direct relationship, uh, or someone on the global stage whom we admire. So, as you look back at your past, Connor, is there somebody that has inspired you in the past, and why? Gee, Alan, it's a <clears throat> it's a really tough question because uh, the, I just take from Noreen, who probably. Uh, more erudite than I would be in, in explaining it, but it, it, it exactly the same. All the way along, you hit hurdles uh, in sport and business, which is whatever career you're in, and it's your ability to overcome them. So different people on the way actually help you. And I suppose rather than summing up with it a person, I've found it's it's not the fair weather friends that I found inspirational. It's the people that have helped me through the tough times that I found inspirational and. Uh, the, especially potentially when you're in sport, you uh, go on to be a much, much more public profile than I would have in the past, but in, in sport, you live it in the moment. So you get your setbacks on the pitch in full glare of everybody and you have to learn to overcome them. And it's too easy just to kind of slither away into the corner and not come out of yourself and, and put yourself forward again. And you have to learn the coping mechanism, one of, uh, accepting the failure that you have, and it can happen even to the greatest, God, I don't know failures, but even to the greatest of players, they happen, and they have to learn to turn that around into a positive, to be able to d go back and deliver their basics absolutely brilliantly. So, uh, you know, there's a, a, a great old UCD uh, person, Stephen Abood, who's currently out in Italy, uh, and did a lot of the work in the academies. Uh, setting up the Irish system. And he'd be an example of somebody who's very much behind the scenes with with people. But a lot of my era would say he was the person who was there when you had your setbacks, your injuries, your you, you played your bad games. That was the phone call you'd get. It's too easy to say the inspiration obviously was your family and your my parents, my dad. You know that goes without saying. But there's people all the way along in this journey that help you learn how to pick yourself up. And they're the ones, the, the pat on the back from the people who are only there when things are going well, irrelevant. Um, for me, it's the people that are there to help you along. And it's at every stage in your journey. And even today, uh, because we're always learning and there's mistakes you make every day in your working life that you kind of, oh, bloody hell, who do I turn to? And you need that person. They're the ones that inspire me. Uh, f f you know, if, if you're an open-minded uh, individual who, who welcomes uh feedback it's it's generally it's certainly my own experience it's generally the person that gives you the harshest feedback that you learn the most from you, you know it's it's like a, you know you're getting a back in my days at arthur anderson getting a performance review you know that the, the, the manager would would give you the six things you're doing well and i'd say but and it's always it's always the but that you learn from it's that one thing uh, but, you know, in rugby, you know, you, you, you know, you forget the ten tries you scored, and you remember the one try that you almost scored. Right? That's the one thing that sticks in your in your mind. But, um... yeah. but, 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 Alan, you you also remember to deliver the 
thing that gave you the 10 tries or deliver the six things that because there's a reason you got to where you got in the first place and you should never right. forget that. And it's it's That's remembering right. that and then looking how you build and reinvent yourself when things aren't going so wrong or reinvent yourself because you've become stayed and historical. So it's it's one thing saying it's you, you can you should never forget what gets you somewhere in the first place because there's a reason you got there and it means you were good at something. Yeah, that's a good point. That actually kind of leads well into our next uh, next question, which is for, for you, Norway. You know, a career uh, from a professional perspective is a is a sequence and a journey. Um, and there's things that you do well in a career and things that 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 don't go so well in a career. And it's the aggregation of all these things that 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 culminate in where we are today. To your point, Connor. And so, Norway, as you look back at, at your career uh, thus far, you know, was there a defining moment that you want to share with us a, a breakthrough that changed you know your career trajectory i think um as as connor has said alan i think that you know it is a you learn as you go and every single day is a new learning day and also uh you know i also agree with what connor said about the fairweather friends because i think that those people that are there with you through that journey as you called it and through that uh, and that know you and that know your worth and your self-worth they can remind you that it's so important to continue believing in yourself, irrespective of what the twists and turns are that come up and irrespective of what it is. And for me, when I retired as a commissioner in 2017, uh, at that stage, having reached the pinnacle of my career and enjoyed 36 years working mostly operationally, but then in also strategic leadership positions, and having reached the pinnacle of being the first ever female commissioner in Garda Shikana, uh, it would have been really easy to just say, OK, I've done that, I've achieved that, I've been a lifetime of this. But, you know, that that need to learn, to grow and also understanding that, you know, again, back to not allowing any situation to define you. I really enjoyed my national, international career, but there's a whole global stage. And one of the defining moments for me was when I was approached, I wasn't particularly looking for a job. Uh, but when I was approached and asked, would I be interested in joining the United Nations? And initially I was saying, actually, I've done this, my career is over. But then I looked at all of the, the challenges and the complexity which the United Nations uh, are trying to address and are addressing. It was also leading up to the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, but also the geopolitical environment was becoming so complex. And the UN were trying to initiate a number of reforms where they wanted to ensure their relevance uh, going forward after the, this 75 year anniversary. So I saw it as a big challenge and I saw it as a great opportunity. I also saw it as an opportunity to learn, but also to contribute my skills. And I had to ask myself, were the skills that I had acquired throughout my career, were they transferable? Were they going to be useful? And did it resonate with me, uh, some of the issues that the UN are grappling with? And I was very excited with the opportunity, but I had to go through a big international competition. Having gone through one of those to get the job I had just come from, uh, I really had to brace myself for that and say, OK, and also to set myself up for the possibility that I might not be successful. Uh, so I had to really brace myself for that. But for me, that was really a career defining moment because it gave me an opportunity to, yes, move out of Ireland, but also to transfer the skills and the learning that I had and to be able to contribute at the global stage. And I've used an analogy before. I felt it was like stepping inside the globe at one of probably the most interesting and defining moment in the history of geopolitics, to be able to look at the whole complexities of the world from the inside, uh, to get an insight and a sense of what was happening in probably most, one of the most dynamic periods in history and to be there to be able to uh, contribute in some way to the information sharing to the decision making that goes on at the center and also then to be able to continue my learning and my growth but to know that i was contributing something to actually uh, the very important work that the un is doing globally so for me that's one of the ones that i would use as that defining moment but actually it comes back to those uh, friends that would say, believe in yourself, go for it, and uh, have that warm hand on your back. That's great, terrific. Well, so if you if you, if you translate that uh, thinking, Connor, into the sporting world, and uh, um, 
uh, certainly you've had a tremendous uh, tremendous career so far in the world of sports um, th there's a there's a famous book by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers uh, and in that book uh, he talks about somewhat controversial but a theory that it takes 10,000 hours of practice plus so, some underlying talent of course but 10,000 hours of practice to achieve mastery um, and uh, you know, I, I think that the pursuit of excellence is something that that you know for for you know famous athletes and world athletes. And you think about the Tokyo Olympics coming up uh, in a couple of months. But you know, the, the golfer that shoots a sixty kind of you know always feels like they could have shot a fifty nine if they made a putt or, or or whatever. But as you look as you look at the world of sports, Connor, and you think about this um, this ten thousand hours, and you reflect on your own career. What, what's your view on what it takes to be? the best in the world in sport right? uh, some of it alan is a bit like there are people that come along in life and famous ucd alumni brian o'driscoll and it is pretty obvious that they're given yeah. a god-given talent that all of us if we practiced until we were blue in the face we would not have so there, there's that element that the absolute superstars that we see in in sport in the game have been given something, but they haven't been given it on its own. They've had to work bloody hard at the same time. And it's getting that mix of having the God given talent. And then you've got the, the ability to, to, to transcend everybody else. Then you've got the workers like myself, who've got modicum of talent who will work incredibly hard and they're necessary on any, on any pitch and in any walk of life. And then you've got the people who work blooming hard and maybe not get a break. And what Noreen, Noreen said there, you, you talked about kind of, I, I describe what Noreen is talking about. There's like sliding door moments, you know, that movie, um, where, you know, one thing can happen and the consequence, you don't know what it's going to be. And for me, that happens in every day of your life on a pitch, off a pitch. It started for me, Alan, before we went into commerce, when I was standing in a phone box in Bangor in Wales, ready to sign up to go in to do a banking and finance degree there. I ring home and say, oh, you've got an offer for commerce. So what would have happened if I had gone to Bangor in Wales to get in the injury that finishes your career, which starts you into, at the age of 29, uh, a, an executive role in sport, as opposed to playing until you're almost put down so i think there, there's so many things in sport that you get and when people talk about ten thousand hours and all the studies you know i think there's studies by Istvan bali and all these people who've talked about long-term athlete development from in the past but actually it's the same in everything you work hard unbelievably hard if you've got talent that will get you a step above the other people and then it's a bit of luck right place right time a wrong place at the wrong time, bounce of a ball, intercept, perception of someone, the subjectivity you don't control of a selector. I'm trying to explain that to your children. Um, you know, the only way you can actually control something is to be an individual and it's first past the post, and even then you mightn't control it. So it's a fascinating area, um, and you just pray that you get loads of people that are as talented as, uh, since we're talking about UCD, the Brian O'Driscolls of the world. Well, it's interesting. I, you know, I, I sometimes uh, talk about my own career journey, and and I say quite like what you just said, Connor, is that you know, success in any career is is a combination of ability, um, willingness, and timing. Uh, you know, and and uh, you've got if if you've got I think you, you you certainly undersold yourself when you say a modicum of talent, Connor. But if you've got a modicum of talent or ability. And you've got the willingness to succeed. A big part of it is timing, being in the right place at the right time. If you happen to be, uh, you know, a great out half, but but um, Johnny Sexton's the guy on the field, uh, it's very difficult. It's the same in, in, in lots of sports. And in fact, I, you know, I, I feel uh, bad at this time, you know, particularly in Ireland, talking about, you know, golfers and great playing sports because I know you're all, you, you know, you're all housebound and under uh, lockdown. Um, as we are in different stages of lockdown throughout the world, but but in this in this uh, pandemic, Noreen, maybe I can switch over to you. Uh, as you think about this lockdown that we're in, and and uh, you know many of us are, are fed up, uh, you know, with the personal implications of COVID, and we're frustrated, and we want to go out and you know have a drink or meet friends or whatever. But how how have you handled the pandemic, Noreen? What you know what what activities or pastimes or distractions have you deployed in the last year to try and stay somewhat sane? Well, it's a very interesting question, Alan, because uh, I'm just reflecting 
it's almost a year ago on the 11th of March when we left, uh, when I left my office in New York with an expectation we would be back in three to four weeks. And here we are almost a year later and probably at least another six months out. And for me, I think I approach it in, in probably three different ways. So again, thinking about the impact and the devastating consequence that this pandemic and COVID in particular has had on individuals. And we have colleagues and friends and family who have lost loved ones. We have colleagues and friends and family who are dealing with the fear and the anxiety, not knowing uh, what impact it's going to have on their own health, on other people's health that are close to them, but also on their businesses, on their opportunities for growth, even on education, as an example. And for me, managing teams, I think it's been really important that actually, you know, you provide that really strong, visible leadership. So even virtually, we've found different ways to communicate, to keep people motivated. Uh, again, because we can't all get out and uh, Connor and you would know this, and particularly from a sporting point of view, it's more difficult to get people together. But I think keeping that sense of connection, even virtually. So, for example, we would do virtual happy hours or we do virtual coffees. It's not the same as being able to meet in person. And then for me personally, I share all of those. And I think recognizing the humanity and the humanness of this pandemic and how it has impacted everybody, no matter where they are in the world. And understanding as well from our own perspective, because I'm sure it's the same for both of you and for everybody that would be listening, but our days seem to have elongated and stretched. So actually making a discipline around kind of managing that time, getting a work-life balance. And yes, it's difficult when you're managing teams on different time zones, et cetera, but actually really defining that. So for me personally, what I like to do is make a point of getting out at least three times in a day, early in the morning, even if it's dark and wet and cold or crispy as it is here this morning, but been out in the fresh air. And you mentioned something earlier about being in the moment and mindfulness. And I think it's important that we ground ourselves in that at the moment and in this moment, because again, we speak about what are we in control of? And we're only in control of what we can do. And I think understanding that, being able to do that and making sure that actually we connect with the people that we want to do. Interestingly, a little anecdote is my sons decided I need something to actually even get more work-life balance. So they introduced me to a balance board and a desert island podcast for a bit of escapism. So my challenge that they've given me is every day for at least 15 minutes on the balance board, listening to desert island podcasts. So it actually works really well, and I would highly recommend it. <laughs> it takes a little bit of getting used to, but they've sent me a challenge to stretch that time a little bit more. So we'll see how we do with that. That's great. I'm not sure I could, I'm not sure I could handle that, but uh, <laughs> look at the balance board. You know, I, I think that the, this, the, the pandemic, there's certainly things to look on um, and be frustrated, but I think it's provided lots of opportunities. Well, I think uh, certainly personally, um, not having to commute into Manhattan, uh, you know, which was for me was an hour and a half door to door each way. So three hours a day on, you know, trains and subways and all that kind of stuff is certainly time that I'm that I'm enjoying. Plus, I think I think we've all discovered uh, what we already knew, which is that we can work effectively from home. We can do things like this. Uh, it's not ideal, but it, it, it um, in many ways it allows you to participate in things that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. So. Um, all right, Connor. Uh, one question for you. So, so, so we all uh, see the Connor O'Shea on the rugby field and on the sidelines, uh, encouraging you know your teammates or the or, or, or the team that you coach. Uh, and so we so we know the public, or th we think we know the public, Connor O'Shea. Um, but is there something about you um, that you're very proud of that we don't know that you'd like to share with us? Uh, you you ask me the r really difficult questions. I mean, because because it's 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 always hard to personalize anything to to yourself or talk about. I I, I think um, a lot of times people want you to be someone different than you are, and I, like I've I've right. kind of gone with the motto for myself anyway the whole way through my career that if if I am going to fail. Uh, and that's not a defeatist side of things because I prefer to succeed. But if I'm going to fail, I'm going to be be myself. I don't want to try and be somebody I'm not. So I'd like to think that whether I am uh, by the side of the pitch, in the office or at home, um, other than my choice of language from time to time, <laughs> uh, 
uh, you wouldn't see anything or, or, or anybody different. And that's people. It's it's a very personal thing. People always ask you, don't they, as they would for the two of you, you know, give me your, your advice on leadership. And I said, well, I can't give you any advice. The only advice I can give you is be yourself. Don't be an imposter. Because if you fail being an imposter, you will never be able to live it yourself. If you do it your way and you're a success, great. And if you're not, at least you can look back and say you've given it. And that's what I try and instill at home. So I really, the, the, the question you asked there, Alan, what I would like to think, if you're going to say, what am I most proud of? I hate that question in its own, in its own way, is that I'm myself the whole time. And what you see on the pitch and off the pitch is exactly the same. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, it goes back to what Noreen was saying earlier, you know, about, you know, facing challenges. And, and uh, you know, my father used to say, uh, keep your two feet on the ground, um, you know, and and, uh, and a, lot, a lot of that is also the, the kind of the Rudyard Kipling if poem. It's about being honest, being true to yourself, uh, you know, staying the course. Um, you know, I say, you know, my, one of my one of my children is uh, He's a very good athlete, uh, but you know, playing golf, for example, if he has a good hole, he's you know the next thing he's he, he thinks he's going to be on the Masters or the PGA Tour, and then he's a bad hole and he wants to sell <laughs> golf clubs. <laughs> but you know, uh, you know, kind of keeping yourself keeping yourself grounded. Um, actually, uh, in your in your choice of language, Connor, we actually recently introduced a, a curse jar. <laughs> where anybody uses a bad word has to put a dollar into the curse jar. It's getting quite full, <laughs> but, the, but the pandemic has, uh, has challenged our linguistic ability. Yeah, no, in my first month back from uh, from Italy, they uh, they put a curse jar in the English Rugby Union for every time I said ciao in terms of hello or goodbye to people. So that jar filled up pretty quickly, but I'm through, I'm through that now. <laughs> <laughs> So, so last question for for both of you, and I'll start with you, Noreen. Uh, so, so obviously you're both Irish, but you both left Ireland, um, and in fact, uh, likewise myself. Um, uh, as you think about your decision to leave Ireland, and, and Noreen, you touched upon this a little bit earlier um, in terms of stepping into a global role. But as you as you look back at, at your decision to leave Ireland, uh, how do you think moving out of Ireland um, helped you? Um, and what do you what do you miss most uh, when you're not there? Yeah, I think uh, you know, Alan. If I can touch back on something that you asked or said that we were discussing around even the pandemic and the opportunities, and I think you know, again, if I look when I moved out of Ireland in 2018, if I if somebody had told me that imagine that we're all going to be catapulted into a world where we can actually all work remotely, we're going to manage our global teams remotely, we can have meetings with 193 member states globally, we would have thought everybody was crazy. But actually those opportunities that come, and yes, it's not easy because we've had to find and adapt uh, ways of working. But I think that's one of the things when I reflect on the time I left and go based in New York, so what helped me going was actually was realizing that the world is a very big place and actually you're not confined just by virtue of where you've spent your career or where you've been born, but actually there are opportunities to develop and grow in different places in the world. And one of the things I enjoyed, uh, my sons, for those that are Irish will understand, I told my sons I was doing my J1 in reverse. So some people get that, some people don't get it, but it means that I was able to get away. They would remind me the difference was I was been paid for it, which is probably true. But one of the things, who wouldn't enjoy living in New York? New York City is an amazing place to be. Uh, you know, it's a real melting pot of activities and cultures and difference, and then mapping the UN onto that, a real multicultural environment. Uh, lots of very different, always not the same perspectives, sometimes very uh, different perspectives in so many ways. But actually, it was a great opportunity for me to actually step out, step onto the global stage and find an opportunity to grow. And back to something Connor said, one thing I always pride myself is being myself. So bringing my whole self to that global stage and actually knowing that I was contributing something that was actually really uh, important in so many ways. And the things I missed, I remember when I went to New York first, even uh, transitioning from uh, a, a house with a garden and two dogs and three cats <laughs> to an apartment <laughs> in, in downtown Manhattan. Very exciting. But then all of a sudden, I remember one, I was about six months there and I went to Washington one day 
arrived in Washington by train, got picked up by a taxi, and it was a beautiful April morning, and I had the window rolled down, and the smell of cut grass. I remember saying, this is the first time I've smelled cut grass, fresh cut grass in about six months. And some of the things I miss about home, I like uh, when time allows and when also we weren't confined by the five kilometre radius, I like hill walking. So I like getting out into the open air, into nature. I like walking hills. Here in Ireland, uh, you can do that within close distance. I used to have to plan it really well if I was in uh, New York or even traveling around the world. I used to have to try to plan places that I could go. So there are some of the things I miss. And of course, I really miss, uh, my sons would cringe if they heard me saying this, but I did really miss them, but I also miss the dogs and the cats and just that sense of being um, connected. And I think particularly when the pandemic hit, I think it's knowing that actually you're closer to your loved ones, that you can actually um, be there in the event that somebody needs you. But I think it's the opportunity is just amazing. And I think the opportunity is to travel, to meet new people, to get an insight and an understanding into different ways of thinking, different ways of being. And also, quite frankly, um, it was a, a fascinating time to be in the center of America um, with everything that was going on and been there to witness history uh, as we were living through it. Excellent. And Connor, what about you? What, 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 uh, what do you miss about, about home? Well, I think I'm pretty fortunate in the sense of how much I would have got back over the years. I think, you know, going going to London isn't exactly <laughs> going across the other part of the world. But uh, the, the few years I spent in Italy, the Italian people are very much like Irish in, in many, many ways, certainly in terms of their family and sense of belonging and the community that they, that they do have over there. So there's a lot of similarities which, which struck me. I think... One of the things I'm always struck by my, my daughters when we go for a walk, and I'll just say hello to somebody quite naturally when you're just walk, walking along. And like my eldest now at 14 get very embarrassed at her dad. Go, what? Have you, why are you saying hello like that? And I said, it's just a very Irish thing. And I think we're, uh, what do I miss? The, the familiarity, I think. Uh, the, the Definitely been around family. The last I've found the last probably six, nine months, even though I'm back in London, more difficult because I haven't been able to get back home um you know just hop on a plane get in say hello to everyone and i'm sure it's the same alan or the minute you just walk in you're at home and it's that just real familiarity but then just what noreen said i i just i left whatever in 1995 uh, at a time when i wanted to experience something different and i've got to meet loads of people uh had so many shared experiences uh that i may have had if i'd stayed in ireland but i don't know if i'd have had at that time uh in 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 sport in ireland um and i've never felt that distant from ireland uh, in in a sense so uh, it is it's the fami familiarity family been able to hop in a car and go down to kerry uh you know all these things that you just take for granted um and i, I love it when i'm back around um but I don't think I'm not, I don't, I've never felt far removed, to be honest. I always feel pretty much at home. Well, I'm sure we're all missing uh, different, dif different aspects of, of our Irishness uh, in, the, in the pandemic. I, I certainly um, have, have missed the, the ability to get home. I, I, usually I'm back in Ireland three or four times a year or, or more and have not been back uh, in 11 months. Um, so, but, but but it's interesting how we've adapted, you, you know, and now I, my mother has now got uh, WhatsApp on her phone. And so now I, I video video her WhatsApp and, she's, and I, I, she tells me I have to give her a notice before I call her because she wants to make sure that she's looking presentable <laughs> before, before I do the video <laughs> call. Um, anyway, I just, uh, you know, thank you. Thank you both, uh, Noreen and Connor, for your time uh, today, your insights, your words of encouragement and support. I think one thing that you've both said um, which is not surprising, but it's worth repeating. You know, you think about leadership and inspiration. You know, being true to yourself. You know, keeping your feet on the ground, being true to yourself, facing facing challenges, learning from what you um, what you do well, uh, and learning from your mistakes. I think are both uh, things that that you've you've both um, echoed as, as we went through this morning. Um, and so with that, I uh, just want to thank you both uh, to our alumni watch watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed this conversation with, uh, with Noreen and Connor. And I wish you well as you go out and you, uh, you walk and you run and you cycle. 
to complete this alumni engagement initiative. So good luck.